Hello, my name is Alan Foom, and today I'm going to talk about non hydrocarbon gases and natural gas fields. So, we got nitrogen, we got hydrogen sulfide, which is really nasty and very dangerous, and we got CO2, which is also fairly unpleasant. We also have others. So, natural gas is mainly composed of methane, CH4. There are also thermogenic natural gases, which contain some heavy hydrocarbons, such as ethane, propane, etc., butane, um, lower end alkanes. But many natural gases also contain some non hydrocarbons. Uh, they can range in percentages from uh, trace to 70-80%. Uh, some of these are valuable, such as helium, some which are a bit of a waste, such as nitrogen, they reduce calorific value, I'll explain what that is in a minute. Uh, some are a problem, such as carbon dioxide, which complicates gas processing, reduces calorific value, increases CO2 emissions. Again, that's a bad thing. And some are hazardous, such as H2S, which is a very dangerous gas. So we'll talk about all of those in a minute. So this video is inspired by these two guys, uh, Colin Percival and Mike Cooper of Trove, uh, the um, uh, Bob Mortimer and Paul Whitehouse of Oil and Gas Exploration in the UK. They do lovely videos with the two of them together. And they did a video on gas discoveries which failed to burn with examples from the UK Southern Gas Basin and an example from Uganda where the president was invited to attend the lighting of a flare and the draw stem test when the flare failed to light, which was kind of embarrassing. So these examples have significant non-hydrocarbon fraction in the gas, which is why they didn't uh, produce the value that was expected. So this is Juan Cortier who uh, posted on LinkedIn about a field in the Southern Gas Basin which turned out to be 45% CO2. Um, that's a fairly unpleasant situation. Obviously, that field cannot be developed because it's uh, it's not uh, viable. Now, when you analyze uh, well logs, non-hydrocarbon gases are gases, so they'll give you a response on the neutron, they'll give you a response on the gamma, they'll give you a response on resistivity. You don't really know until you sample. Okay, they, um, some of them have different densities to methane, so you might be able to get something out of density if you know what you're looking for, but sample your gas values when you, do a, when you find something. And this is the Uganda example, again from Ian Cloak, um, which is uh, Albertine uh, Lake Basin. So this is Lake Albert on the western edge of Uganda. This is the discovery here, which is uh, which is labeled to Rakal. And uh, when they came to try to test the well to, to get it to flow, it flowed, but unfortunately it didn't light because it was mainly CO2, which was a bit embarrassing since the president of Uganda was invited to visit the, to view the test. That kind of makes you look a bit silly, so you kind of really don't want to do that. So, calorific value. So, that's the heat content of a fuel. It's generally measured in the billions of uh, thermal units, British thermal units per cubic foot, and megajoules per cubic meter. So, most natural gases that you have in your system have a value between 34 and 52 megajoules per cubic meter, so 950 to 1050 BTU per, per standard cubic foot. Uh, again, um, American tends to use BTU per standard cubic feet. Uh, Europe tends, and the rest of the world tends to use uh, megajoules per meter cubed. And the calorific value is determined by the components, which will include methane, ethane, propane, butane, as well as non hydrocarbon gases, nitrogen, CO2, hydrogen sulfide, helium. You kind of want to keep hydrogen sulfide out of it. Higher CV gases have a higher proportion of C2, plus, that's ethane. Plus. So sometimes you may wish to enrich your gas to meet uh, the specifications of a, of a uh, system. Whereas lower calorific value gases then have more nitrogen CO2. So for example, uh, the permian Groningen field in the Netherlands, which is the big, big field uh, over there, has 14% nitrogen and has a calorific value of 35 megajoules per cubic meter compared to pure methane, which is 39.8. Uh, in fact, as growing in production has ceased in the Netherlands, they've had to add nitrogen to other gases to make them uh, fit the specifications because all their appliances are set up for this calorific value. And the gases tend to be blended in port terminals to have a stable calorific value within the national grid. So as in this example here. And in America, you've got pure methane. That's the US average, whereas North Dakota and West Virginia tend to have higher, richer gases. Again, uh, depends what's going on there. So helium, most valuable of the gases, you know, $250 per litre, that's a lot of money. And most of it is sourced for impurities in natural gas fields. So here's got an example here, the Hugerton field in Kansas, USA. So that's Oklahoma, that's Kansas going off into the Texas panhandle. Um, and some of these fields can have up to 10% helium content. 3% is more typical, 0.3 is kind of the economic limit. And the helium is sourced by radioactive decay thorium and uranium. The common elements are petrochemical source rock, but there's also some helium sourced from uranium in the basement. 
And high helium content tend to also be associated with high nitrogen content. So nitrogen I'll talk about a little bit in a minute, but helium is genuinely valuable. And several companies are now exploring specifically the helium because it is so valuable. Helium production worldwide. Uh, so this is a chart showing where they come from. So this is the um, systems within Canada, within Oklahoma and Kansas, within Wyoming, in uh, Canada, in Algeria, in Poland, in uh, Russia, Orenburg, which is near the Kazakhstan border, Qatar, which has be now become a major supplier, and Australia. So here we have helium production versus storage. And the price of helium has gone up uh, quite a lot as storage has declined now because demand has increased. And this is where helium is being used for, you know, cryogenics, control the atmosphere for specific welding. So it's not just balloons at parties. It's actually a very valuable resource. Nitrogen, a far less valuable resource, uh, has no value because air is 80% nitrogen. Most people tend to get nitrogen from air, the effects of distillation of air, but although um, some of this nitrogen might be used for fertilizer as effectively as a byproduct because it's there. And the various sources for it, mantle degassing, atmospheric contamination, sulfate reduction, clay diagenesis, coal maturation, tends to be associated with coal source rocks. So for example, the Permian Rock Ligand place, so this is an example of a combrick from the Netherlands from the western part of the Permian Basin and the eastern part of the Permian Basin, Poland, where they have a significant problem with nitrogen as a contaminant. And this is how nitrogen is effectively done. So effectively you have hydrocarbon phase charge and this is late phase charge of nitrogen. So you need to do quite detailed modeling to, uh, to put uh, it into perspective. And because the source from carboniferous coals has a high nitrogen, and we mentioned Groningen already, so that's at, uh, in, in the Netherlands, that has a high nitrogen content. Again, this is a piece of mapping from Karnowski where he's mapped occurrences of nitrogen. Carbon dioxide. So significant portion of some gas, natural gas fields, and here is a chart showing percentages, which can be quite high in some cases. This is actually a log chart. So in some cases in the pre-salt in Brazil, where you have mainly produced oil, you have quite a lot of associated CO2, which you then have to re-inject. I'll come to that in a minute. Um, CO2 is corrosive, requires special steels, equipment, wells, production processing systems. So you need to design for it. You can't cope with it. It's not that difficult. It can be hazardous, particularly as an asphyxiant. So it ponds in confined spaces. So if a trench can pond within a trench, if someone's digging in the trench, they can suffocate. It's it's something which you need to take care of, particularly confined spaces. But you can manage that effectively. Uh, but it also increases it reduces calorific value, you have significant content, and CO2 emissions from produced natural gas is also a climate issue. So high CO2 gas production may be financially penalized or stopped by regulators. So that's very country dependent, but it's a problem particularly for Western companies, but also for the world in general. So source of CO2, carbonate content in source rocks. Thermal decomposition of limestone, particularly buried very deeply, thermochemical sulfate reduction, or hot fluids from deep crust of the mantle. Again, it's a complex issue, and this is CO2 percentages in the, in the, in the USA. This is Tunisia and Libya, um, Pelagian Basin, so this is where I've worked in this area. So you have uh, reservoirs both in Cretaceous and the Eocene, and these have a very, very complex distribution of CO2. For example, the Buri field in Libya, which is located here, has a 42% uh, CO2 content associated gas, whereas nearby fields have virtually none. It's very complicated it's to do with the uh, thermal alteration of the source rocks, to do with some uh, deep carbonates, which may have been thermally heated. Complicated story. We did a quite extensive piece of work of it uh, for, my, for my former employers. Um, so this is what I'm allowed to tell you. Sleipner field in Norway. So this is the, a diagram from Eddie Ong. Sleipner field has uh, high associated CO2, up to 9%. Norwegians are very CO2 focused in terms of climate uh, awareness. So they basically said no CCS, no project. So what uh, Statoil, the former opera the operator, who's now called Equinor, did was they re-injected the CO2 in the Utsira sand up here, way above the reservoir. So first CCS project in the world, been going since 1996, quite an interesting case study. Hydrogen sulfide really nasty stuff. So Trove did a quite extensive video, please check it out, uh, by Mike Cooper. It's a major HSE risk. Level 100 ppm is fatal. So you're working with H2S, you need gas masks, you need respirators, all the protections you ever need. Alarms, measuring devices, etc. We take it very, very seriously. Also heavier than air can point in confined spaces. You can manage the risks special procedures, special materials, you remove the gas during gas processing, but you really need to take care. About a third of the gas fields in the world will contain some H2S. 
And this is another area which I worked in, which is North Caspian. Uh, this is Kashagan. I was on the team that worked on that. Um, and this is Astrahan, which is a major city in southern Russia. So this is Kazakhstan, this is Russia, this is the northern part of the Caspian Sea. This thing has over 20% H2S above a city of about 600,000 people, below the city of about 600,000 people. Very serious problem. Um, the H2S is sourced from breakdown of sulfates in the source rocks and hydro gypsum, etc., due to thermal heating. Um, and elemental sulfur is a major waste product. It's also a big problem in Western Canada. Um, Massive problem when it is onshore near populated areas. But please watch the trove video because it explains it in a lot more detail. So how do you predict non-hydrocarbon gases? Well, this is challenging. You can build advanced basin models like we did for Tunisia, Libya. Uh, you can map uh, play forever mapping like you did in Poland. You can analyze the source rocks if you have samples. Or you can map locations of volcanics or any thermal vents, etc., that may may um, alter that. But it certainly actually really works if you've got some data. If you're looking at in front of your mature basins, it's extremely uncertain. You really don't know what you're going to get. But even in mature areas, you get surprises. There was one field I worked on where some of the layers had virtually no CO2, others had quite significant CO2. So you will get surprises and you need to take them into account. And how do you account them in volumetrics? Well, you need to account for them, particularly if they're likely to form a significant portion of the gas volume. Well, it's greater than 1%, for example. You can estimate from basin models, play fairways, nearby discoveries, but there's always high uncertainty. You need to have a range of non-HC content. You can model that probabilistically, have video modeling things, uh, modeling volumetrics probabilistically in areas where this situation is likely. If you've got a binary situation, for example, a process can contain 20% nitrogen, 80% nitrogen content, or 80% nitrogen content can be seen as effective failure. You need to put that into the risking, into the source component, and you can assign a probability to a high nitrogen case where that would be extra on top of all the other risks that you, uh, that you have in terms of volume uh, estimating your risking. So summarize, non-hydrocarbon gases can be an unpleasant surprise. Some are hazardous, H2S, again, please watch Mike's video on that, or problematic, such as CO2. Some are wasteful, such as nitrogen, but helium is valuable. And non-hydrocarbon content will be hard to predict, even in mature areas. Very, very difficult in, in frontier areas. So please analyze your gas before inviting the president to witness a flare on the DSD test because it can be a bit embarrassing when it doesn't burn. So thank you very much. Please like, please subscribe, and I'll see you on the next one.